Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Another Dime in the Jukebox. Ba-da, 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 <laughs> da, 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 I love rock and roll. Put another dime in the ju- wait. Wait a second. If I continue the song, do you have to pay royalties to Joan Jett then and the arrows and everybody? I'm gonna cost you so much money today. Oh my gosh, you are gonna cost me cost me so much money if you sing it. Yeah. But you know what? I think that if you sing it, it's okay. I think right. you okay. can actually play the real Joan Jett uh, R- right. track right. on my show. Then then I would have to pay royalties. So but- here's something you don't know, and one of the main reasons why I already like you. Um one of the amazing um re- one of the, one of the amazing rewards you get from working in the music industry is if you and your team do good work and the audience likes your artists and you sell a certain amount of copies you get a gold album or a platinum record and so forth um hanging up in one of the rooms is the is the Joan Jett I love rock and roll um gold award for Canada for selling 50,000 copies in this country which oh you know yeah yeah, so that was it. And I was like, who is this woman? Why does she want to talk to me? What's her, you know, what's her hidden agenda? And then I was like, you know, hey, she's got a cool title. And then I looked at you up and then I was like, oh, my gosh, who wouldn't want to talk to Maria? Thank you. Oh, my gosh, Eric, thank you so much. I cannot believe that I'm hearing this from you, uh, because like I said, you are the most notable person I have interviewed so far. And it's just, it's a huge honor. And I'm really feeling like, well, I I must be really getting somewhere. And like what you just said about, uh, like, <clears throat> obviously when I first reached out to you, you didn't know who I was. But thank you for, you know, checking out my stuff. And I mean, obviously the name, like it lets everyone know that my blog has to do with rock music, that it's about rock and roll. But I mean, honestly, dude, thank you so much again for like saying yes. And um, so you were named best in social media by the Billboard magazine, the National Post and the Post magazine. Yeah, they all got it wrong. Um, no, I'm only kidding. Um, yeah, social media is something that I, I started to do once all of the main sites got online. Um, I I was late to the game for MySpace. And then uh, I, I got on Facebook and then I got on Twitter once it first started. And Twitter in the beginning was just a community of, of like-minded people and mompreneurs, moms that were essentially staying at home that, that my wife was one. And then um, we just got this huge kind of community that way, but really social and then Instagram and, 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 uh, and now TikTok. And it's really just a, it's really given me the ability to purge all of the useless information that I have in my head and stuff I find and nobody to share it to. So I now get to share it with whatever the audience is and whoever cares. Um, And that's all it really is. It was never, it was never a plan. It was never, um, because it's funny because when I deal with artists, on a day-to-day basis and talking to them, not only about publicity and promotion and marketing and social media, there's always a, a, I would tell them that, you know, uh, there's, there's ways to do it well. And, you know, an artist's job along with creating the best song in the possible universe is to kind of reveal who they are as people. You know, anybody can like a, a tweet or an Instagram post, but in order for them to believe in what you do, And for them to connect with you, they have to kind of, you have to do that in order for them to follow you. And I don't do any of that, to be honest with you. I know how to get a lot of followers on those networks. I know how to get a lot of like, I could just post all day photos of Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and get a lot of likes that way. Um, But it would be really, it would be really boring for me. So I post about hip hop stuff. I post about classic rock. I post about today's music or Billie Eilish or Kendrick Lamar or today's day in music and stuff like that. And, and I do it cause it's fun cause I want to do it. And so, um, yeah. And I guess other people have kind of noticed and, and here we are. And that brought me to you. Uh, yes, yes, it did. Because I started following you on Instagram. I think it was in 2020. Uh, let's see. I have it written in my notes. I think it was like in 2020 or 2021. Sometime. Yeah, that was your first mistake. 
No, I'm not kidding. Oh, so let me look it up. Oh, yes. It says, I've been following you, your page, on Instagram since 2021. And, I mean, you always post a lot of really funny stuff. I mean, I always like your posts mainly because I like the joke. Like, it always makes me laugh. And I always thought, like, who is this really cool guy who posts so many funny things, but also, you know, posts about rock and roll and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun, you know, Instagram, because I can't I mean, on Twitter, I can I post 52 times a day. It's every half hour on the hour. And then I just kind of go through that day and find the stuff that I like the best and post it on 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 Instagram. And um but yeah, you know, it it's been it's been a a wild ride that before social media, I had the exact same job as what I'm doing now, which is doing publicity for bands and artists and record labels and and the the the, the social side of it is kind of um allowed me to talk to um some really amazing people to find some really great people um and just kind of hang out and and kind of, you know, cure some of the boredom that goes on um in my daily life. A nightly life and weekend life. <laughs> yeah, well, you definitely have like a miles long list of really, really famous clients. And I am going to get to that later. I mean, I read all about it in your website. And I was honestly amazed at the very, very long list of famous singers and bands that you have worked with. Before. Yeah, it's been um, when I started working at a uh, at a distribution company called Koch and Koch at the time with the uh, North America's largest independent distribution company. And before I started working for them, for me, it was all about record labels and artists. It, I, I didn't know the first thing about distribution. I thought distribution was essentially, and kind of is moving a box of CDs or vinyl records from the warehouse to the record store. And that was it. And that's all Koch really kind of did along with some marketing and advertising and stuff like that. So when I started working there as a publicist, it was, um, it was really working with not only all the record labels that we were distributing, um, but whenever the artists came to Canada, they've never really had anybody working for them because the record label was based in America or the UK. They didn't, they knew about Canada, but we were like 4% of the world market to them. So they were going to spend 4% of their day on it. Here's the box of CDs. Here's the photos. Here's the bio. Go for it. Call me if you need anything. And so that gave me the ability to work, you know, people like the Wiggles and Ringo Starr and Ray Charles and Guar and all of these, you know, Barry Manilow and, and and Bob Geldof and Sinead O'Connor and so many artists that I don't think I would have ever had an opportunity to work and get all of this amazing experience, not just working one specific artist from one specific style of music. Because I know publicists that are out there that do that. They only do rock or they'll only do metal. And that's great. I want to work more. I want to work you know, the global music stuff. I want to work pop. I want to work jazz and blues and classical and soul and funk and 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 everything in between. So that kind of got me um, the ability to learn all about not only the, the different styles of music, um, but the language used when, when pitching the media, what to look for, and kind of opened up the ability for me to work with all parts of the media, whether it was business or family or sports, um, because everybody had their own interest. And when you only work, I think, one specific brand of music or genre, that's great for the sales. It's great for the branding aspect of it. Um, but I, I kind of love the variety of it so much so that I still do it now, working with, with every kind of genre that's out there. Well, you definitely have to be very talented in order to dedicate yourself and be interested in working with so many different styles um, of music. Because I know, like for me personally, when I started Another Dime in the Jukebox about two years ago, it was I knew that I wanted to focus on rock and roll specifically. Mm. Although... Um, in the beginning, uh, I started out as making posts on my Instagram page. And what they were essentially, there were like 
facts about rock music and I had a different theme every week. Like the very first theme that I had was um, facts about Sid Vicious. Because I was a huge fan of Sex Pistols when I was in college. That was, when I, that was when I listened to them the most. And I knew from like, I did some previous research back in those days and I knew that Sid Vicious had a really, really crazy life, that he was up to some pretty insane antics. And so two years ago, I googled facts about Sid Vicious, and what I found was I read the whole article and that the information, like, and the content of it just, it's definitely really shocking, but also very interesting in a way. And it's interesting because... It's so shocking because he was raised by a drug addict, because he was completely violent. He was in a world famous rock band, but he couldn't play bass. Right. So it's a lot of really peculiar facts about someone whose life was, well, basically pretty shitty. Like, yeah. pretty much right from the beginning. And, like, I feel really bad for him, but I also hate him. Like, I think that Sid Vicious is a complete asshole, but. At the same time, he's a very fascinating character in rock and roll history. So that's how I started my blog. And ever since then, it has evolved into, I went from doing posts on Instagram into doing actual live interviews. However, I do still want to focus on rock and roll specifically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, when, when you when you just take the term rock and roll that branches out to everything, it's, it's you know, take the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. where... Um, you know, online, whenever I post about uh, who has been inducted in the years, um, you know, previous years of 13, 14, 15 years since I've been on social media, there, there's always that conversation of like, well, you know, Missy Elliott this year who's being inducted isn't rock and roll or Kate Bush isn't rock and roll. Um, but anything um, th there's I mean, rap music has got the spirit of rock and roll in it. Country music has that spirit of rock and roll, anything that upsets parents and um, questions authority and does things by coloring outside the lines a little bit of straight ahead pop music. To me, it's rock and roll. Billie Eilish is rock and roll. Um, it, it, she's not rock and roll in the way that Def Leppard is rock and roll, um, but she is definitely a punk. She's definitely you know, kind of changing the system from within and, and speaking her voice and using her power for good. Um, and so rock and roll to me has always been a spirit. I mean, even going back to the, when I was a kid listening to music from the fifties of, of Buddy Holly and Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis and Fats Domino. Um, when, when you take a look at those artists and you only listen to, you know, something like, Great Balls of Fire by Jerry Lee Lewis. And you realize that, you know, it's a great rock and roll song, but it comes from boogie woogie piano playing. And that comes from R and B. And that comes from Tin Pan Alley. And that comes, that comes, that comes, that comes. And it just goes all the way back to realistically, you know, modern era of the 1920s, where it's like blues and country music merging together. And the rhythm part was the rock part. And the role part was a symbol of that. And so the ability to say, well, you know, certain people shouldn't be considered rock and roll. Like I get it. I get it. That's the stuff for record stores to figure out about where to put certain artists um, in, in nice little niche categories. Um, but other than that, you know, there's, there's a lot of rock and roll that you can use at the diving point, not only for this podcast, but for people's taste and not have to worry about whether or not, you know, I only listen to rock and roll, so there's nothing else for me out there. Or there's no more, there's no new rock and roll. It's like, yeah, there is. You just got to look for it a little tiny bit deeper with the 160,000 songs that are being uploaded every single day on Spotify. Yeah, that's true. Um, I'm also a huge fan of pop music. And I'm a huge fan of Taylor Swift. I love Katy Perry. I listen to some old Britney Spears every once in a while. Ariana Grande. Um, Billie Eilish. I do like a couple of Billie Eilish songs. I have recently revisited hip hop from like the early 2000s. Because mm -hmm. uh, I remember that when I was in the 10th grade, I took uh, hip hop lessons. 
You were you were in the fifth grade in the in the two thousands. Ah, uh, tenth grade. Tenth, tenth grade. grade. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm thirty one. I just turned thirty one. Um. Ah, happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. My birthday was on June tenth. Yes. So, like, as I was saying, like, I definitely listen to not just rock music but also pop and some hip hop. But you are definitely right when you say that like Billie Eilish is not rock and roll in the same way that the Leppard is or Motley Crue or the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh, and you made me want to actually look into her like biography because I do like Billie Eilish, but I only know maybe like a couple of songs. Mm. Uh, because I remember that when I tr- like I checked her out on Spotify, like whenever I want to check out a new artist, I mean, obviously with Spotify, the reason why I love it so much is because you literally have any piece of music you want to listen to. Everything. Like, like Everything everything in the history of recorded music is at your exactly. fingertips. It's yeah. great. It's great that way. It's so good that like you, like we now have the ability and I, I get like, the 0.004 cents that the artists make and all of that stuff. But on a consumer side, you know, the ability to to say, you know, I'm going to go check out the new, you know, Ariana Grande tune or the new Olivia Rodrigo tune and see if I like it. And it's right there. You don't have to cross your fingers and hope and pray that the record store, even if you have one in your city, um, has it in stock. You know, everything potentially that was recorded and released is out there. So it's so easy to find all this really great stuff. You know, Taylor Swift's Folklore album and Evermore aren't that far away from the people that she worked with from the National. National is rock. This was a rock album. It was a folk album, granted. But, you know, it was it was a, um, you know, a, 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 no more no more authentic than people who will claim that Wilco is one of the greatest bands in the world. And and they are, they're definitely up there. Um, but, you know, Taylor Swift was doing kind of remarkably similar music. Um, so she should be considered, you know, kind of mixing between the folk and the roots and the rock and the pop stuff too. You know, it's what makes her so great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because she, I mean, she originally started as a country artist. Yeah. So you can definitely, um, I mean, with Taylor Swift, I would say that her latest stuff is definitely more on the pop side. But honestly, I would have to learn some more about like what makes each style of music like that particular style. Like what specifically makes, makes Taylor Swift pop and not so much country. Although her earlier stuff, I'd say it's definitely a mix of pop and country yeah like, for sure some country in there but it's definitely let's say like 85 percent pop music oh yeah yeah, yeah. especially those, those middle albums and of of uh 1989 mm-hmm. um i mean you know you look back on her career and whether it was all calculated however long from the beginning of her career it was always world domination um you know the 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 brilliant thing about what she was able to do was have have the ability to leap from the country world to the pop world and do it well and not have to worry about whether or not if the country music supporters are going to be there for you. Because once you leave the country music world for another style of music, it's really, really hard for them to forgive you because they want you to be in this box here and don't ever stray from from that. And you know, if Taylor Swift were, were to put out another country album, it would blow up on country radio just the same because she is not only that important and that big, but she moves the music industry, bending it at her will so that other people who wouldn't normally be able to go from country to pop and back to country, she would only because she is easily the the most powerful artist out there, bar none. There's nobody that even... She's like Michael Jordan. She's changing the game with every single release that she does. And I'm not saying that from a fan perspective, but just from a a purely business critical look that the things that she has done, whether it's it's fighting and winning with Apple, whether it's getting shafted with not being able to buy her catalog from Scooter Braun when Big Machine's um, 
you know, sold her 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 music and her master recordings. Um, there 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 wasn't anybody that was able to do the things that she was able to do, fighting with Spotify and winning. So, yeah, props to her. You know, she's done well. That's an understatement. Taylor Swift has done kind of okay for herself. <laughs> well. <laughs> I definitely need to check all of that out because I saw uh, Miss Americana on that. Yeah. Once. Yeah. And it has been a while. I think it has been maybe a few months since I saw that uh, the documentary, but I definitely need to check it out again. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to rock and roll. I became really intrigued with learning about the pack stories of the artists. When I first read the biography of Shiri Curry, when I was 21. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, well, I'm pretty sure that you know who Sheree Curry is. She was the original lead singer of The Runaways. That was yeah. Joe Jett's very first band. And um, in 2010, uh, a, a Runaways biopic came out. It starred Kristen Stewart and Dakota Fanning. And actually when I was 16, I was kind of obsessed with Twilight as many of my peers were back then, because as you remember, it just had come out like what, 2008? Yeah. Huge back then. And so obviously uh, I was one of the people who read the books. I became obsessed with it for a while. And because Kristen Stewart was in Twilight, it kind of led me to check out some of her other movies. Right. And, I and she was in the Runaways movie. Yeah. And she was in the Runaways movie. And I yeah that when I was 18 and honestly I I really liked it I really really loved the atmosphere back then um at that age I was not yet so like particularly fascinated with like the whole concept of rock music like I listened to some rock and roll I listened to some I've had Chilla Peppers like I said I listened to the Sex Pistols Kiss a little bit of Leonard Skinner but uh, my interest in rock and roll wasn't as heavy back then as, as it is now but nonetheless i love the runways and two they years, make you want to run away from home and join a rock and roll band after i have learned about their experience with kim fowler yeah it was pretty bad i really want to run away uh with a manager like that but yeah to be completely honest yeah um when i was um about 25 so it was sometime a few years later after I saw the movie, I was reading a Runaways biography that was called, let me look it up because I totally completely forgot the name of it. I should have it in my Kindle libraries. That's okay. Oh, Queens of Noise. Mm, okay. Yeah, it was called Queens of Noise. And... It's by well, I'm not gonna say the author now because the book is still like loading on my app and the font is too small to read right now. But um, I never really finished it. But the part that I was reading in the beginning described like how uh, the that's a golden endorsement. Oh yeah, I never really finished the book, but <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I was busy back then. Yeah, so yeah, for sure lazy but you know it's on my list of books yeah. that I will read in the future I never finished it back then but I remember that when I was reading the part about how all of the girls were getting together to form the band particularly Joan Jett and Sandy West because they were the first two original members of the band who like started to get the whole thing together because at first Joan Jett was the one who came up to Kim Fowley when she read his flyer that he's looking to set up a band full of teenage girls and she said well i play guitar and kim fowley led joan jett to find sandy west and they uh, they got together they started jamming and then later <clears throat> lita ford joined them and <clears throat> it was nikki Steele who later after she left the runways joined the bangles mm -hmm. of course and <clears throat> Shortly after Mickey Steele Steel left the band, um, Sherry Curry joined. And uh, <clears throat> so, like, like I said, when I was reading that whole part about how the girls were getting together, I was like, 
I want to learn how to sing. And at the age of 25, I started taking voice lessons for the first time since high school. Because last time I took voice lessons before that was when I was in the 10th grade. When I went to college, I went to a design school because I wanted to do fashion, but I have recently decided to switch my career paths. And this is like interviewing rock and roll musicians, interviewing anyone who has anything to do with rock music is what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so when I was 25 and I was reading Queens of Noise, that inspired me to start taking voice lessons again and hopefully maybe sing the band one day. I still take the voice lessons, but when I was 21, I read uh, Neon Angel, which is Shuri Curry's biography, and honestly, she went through so much in her life. She yeah. overcame sexual abuse, she overcame drug addiction. The first yeah. time that I read that book, I could not put it down, and I was like, oh my gosh, Like I, I love reading about this. Yeah, and nobody knew about any of that stuff at the time. Oh yeah, yeah. That's true. And like, that's like what my heart was like literally breaking for her for most, like, uh, as I was reading the book. But then again, she really sounded like she was able to move on with her life and bounce back from things. Maybe like, um, I mean, maybe it wasn't as, um, maybe she wasn't necessarily, um, so what I'm trying to say is, to me, she really seemed like, you know, she was able to eventually, like, heal, like, overcome all of the troubles that she went when she was able to. Yeah, for sure. Why? Yeah. Because you don't really have a choice. Because you have, you have to still get up in the morning and put one foot in front of one another and go and do the things and start putting walls up and closing ranks on the people who did you wrong? And it's a good tell t story. I think for, you know, th that kind of symbolic story and, and real life story that she went through is probably what a lot of these kind of teenagers are going to be dealing with in the age of TikTok and in the age of sudden fame and becoming famous and having a lot of followers very, very quickly for maybe not a lot of talent. And that's not to say that the Runaways didn't have talent because they, they absolutely did. did. But yeah. the amount of sharks and the amount of people who work in in any of the industries of entertainment that are just looking for the next content creator or the next um, piece of a paycheck, it's, it's a... It's a pretty harrowing tale of what could go wrong if you don't have good people surrounding you. That is definitely very true. Uh, honestly, they uh, they definitely got extremely unlucky with the fact that Kim Fowley was their manager. And I remember that at one point when I was watching that movie with my mother because I decided to like share that part of myself with her. And as my mother and I were watching it, she was at one point she said, well, that man is absolutely disgusting. But then again, who else is going to like be doing this for them? Who else is going to be managing? managing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's funny because I don't think it was just unluckiness. I, I think it's just a lack of people looking out for you. You know, when, you know, you, you see in the music industry so many, you know, this industry in history is is littered with bodies, not only in terms of death, but in terms of just lost careers because they were led astray by somebody who didn't have their best interest at heart. The parents weren't around. They had to move to another state in order to become famous. There was no protection. There were no laws. There was no Me Too movement. There was no social media to find out about people. It wasn't really being unlucky. I think it was just the fact that, that nobody was looking out for them as much as the girls and the women themselves were looking, were trying to look it out for one another in a very male dominated industry that couldn't care less about whether or not if they survive three years down the road. Um, and, and I think we're going to hear more and more of those stories, you know, going back to what I was saying before about these artists who 
express themselves personally, revealing about their mental health issues, revealing about um, what's going on in their lives, not making as much money as they thought that they were going to, having to write songs on a daily basis and putting them out in order to maintain that creative status on Spotify so that their fan base doesn't forget about them. Um, and and all the while going through a global pandemic that absolutely shattered three years worth of life for a great amount of people. And we're going to be hearing about these stories about how they were being treated more and more, whether you're a woman, whether you're a member of the LGBTQIA plus community, whether you're a member of the BIPOC community, whether you, whether your background, race or color or, or economic status the ability for anybody out there to continue to have to feed the beast of fame and popularity and likes and hits and shares on social media there are more and more and more and more people whose goal it is isn't to become great it's to become famous and when you have that you start to have a little bit of a blurred vision of putting on your blinders, trying to make sure that you are protected at all costs rather than being great, which you can be left alone in the studio and create great art and have the fame come to you. You still have that back to fall on. The fact that you've practiced, the fact that you know how to write a song, the fact that you can know how to work in the studio when your only goal in your success and then your goal becomes a reality to become famous. You just don't simply have, I think the wherewithal to fall back on very many things um, because you're just tossed aside once that fame starts because there's nothing in it for anybody to look at you and go, well, at least you can write great songs, write another one, or at least you can tour really well. Let's go out on tour and get away from stuff. When you're just famous for famous sake, that's it. You are on your own. And I think the runaways story isn't going to be far off from what we're going to be seeing in the next little bit. It's a great little tale, though. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, it definitely is. And that book is what led me to my general love of rock and roll biographies. The next one that I read, the next uh, book that I read was... <clears throat> Dirty Rocker Boys by Bobby Jean Brown. Mm. And I'm pretty sure that you remember her as the chick who was in the Warren Cherry Pie video. Right, right. Yeah. She was uh, married to Johnny Lane, engaged to Tommy Lee. And then a week after he proposed to her, Tommy Lee married Pam Anderson on the beach in Cancun because he followed her there. Oh, wasn't the 80s fun? Oh my gosh, I bet. I bet. I always sometimes wish that I actually lived in the 80s and the 70s. It's actually, it's more like a romanticized pipe dream because... It is absolutely that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because like not only, I, every single time I said having one of those fantasies, I always keep telling myself that like, uh, well, first of all, there was no, like, not only wasn't there any social media, which I use in the daily... There's day, no cameras. Well, there were cameras, but there was no none, none the way, yeah, yeah. There was no Amazon Prime. People had to actually watch commercial commercials. Yeah. I haven't um had like a regular cable TV since I was about nine years old. Yeah, because ever since then my mother and I just uh we had a huge VHS collection. Well, it wasn't exactly huge, it was like um I'd say medium size, but I rewatched a lot of the movies in it. Yeah. I was a kid. And so yeah. for younger people listening, advertisements were these 30 second things that were used to sell products in between the television shows. And oh, was the only reason why television shows existed was to sell that. But like even in the 80s, you had like Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue and and Warrant and all of these sunset strip bands just demolishing over one in a poison. Like they were just absolutely self-destructing and loving it. You know, yes, they were. That's exactly what I love about Motley Crue as well. I read their book too. After the dirt came out, it was gosh, it's already been four years. It's like it's unbelievable. Yeah, but it's already been four years since the dirt came out on Netflix, and I remember that. I mean, before the movie came out, I listened to Motley Crue. I I think that I started listening to their music when I was like also maybe like nineteen or twenty, 
And then uh, in 2019, the movie came out. I saw it. And that's what also led me to read the book. I think The Dirt was good, it, even though it received poor reviews from critics. And it's not exactly historic, historically accurate. Like, they changed up some things. I don't think that um, Douglas Booth was necessarily a good choice to play Nikki Six. He doesn't really look like a rock star to me. And even though he, uh, I did like the scene in which uh, the paramedics resurrect him as Nikki Six. Not only did it actually happen, but I actually I think that he kind of nailed that. But other than that, I think he he's kind of like a little too sweet looking to really. Be yeah, I, I didn't see the series. Once I read the book, I didn't need to know more. Only because it's like it's been said. Everything is in that book. Um yeah. it, it it's uh I mean yeah. It it you, you couldn't make up the stuff that was in there. Um but yeah, yeah, book is amazing. But I never I never saw saw the series though. I didn't need anybody to recreate in my own head what was going on when I was around at that time, not necessarily being in LA, but I remember at least the public version of a lot of those stories and, and people I knew that hung out with them and stuff. So yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. And were, so you're based in Toronto, Canada. Yep. And you, were you born there? I was, where are you? I am. Well, I'm currently in Los Angeles. Okay. I have been in Los Angeles since 2010. I moved out here to go to design school and right. I loved it so much. Luckily, my parents were like able to both find jobs here back then. And I just loved it here so much that I never really left. Yeah. Originally, I'm from Russia, but I haven't, I moved to the States when I was 10 years old and I haven't really been back since. Because really, there is no reason for me to go there. I don't have any rel relatives there, and yeah. honestly, I just got so so like wrapped up in my life in the states. Like first, it was like middle school, high school, then college, and then obviously in my twenties, I was trying to build a career for myself. I had some part time jobs. I took some classes. I was really busy hanging out with my friends. So, um, I mean, I have a life here. No need to yeah. back to Russia. But yeah, I've been living in LA since 2010. Do you still have a lot of family in Russia? No, not really. Only my grandmother. Yeah. yeah. Well, she's family. She is family. But yeah, honestly, my grandma and I were, were never really that close. I'm out of all the uh, family members that I have, I'm the closest to my mother because, like, she and I have been together, like, pretty much ever since, well, I was a kid because. I was raised by a single mother. For the yeah. Most, yeah, I've had two stepfathers. Um, but <clears throat> my last stepdad, my second stepfather, and my mother divorced back in 2014. Yeah, they're still kind of friends, though. It wasn't like a really bad divorce. It was pretty amicable. But I didn't really pay attention to that at the time because I was like 22. I was really busy with my college work and... I was pretty busy taking care of like. What did you go to college for? Um, I went to college. My major was product design. Originally, I wanted to go into fashion. Yeah. But unfortunately, because I couldn't, I couldn't really do all that well in the figure drawing class my freshman year because it was really intense. I switched. I decided to go into product design instead of fashion design because in product design, essentially, what it was is it's a study of. Uh, furniture design, like home goods design. They also did some, my section of the major was called the soft goods section. Essentially that was like jewelry, accessories. I was really focused on handbags and I studied that when I was in college. After graduation, I did some fashion internships. And then when I was 24, I started going out a lot because I had finally graduated. I didn't have homework to do. And so I started checking out the LA live music scene. Yeah. And the first time that I went on Santa's trip, I think it was in the summer of 2016. I went to the Viper room 
for the first time when I was 24 and I didn't even freaking know how iconic that club was at the time like I would I think that at the time I was like, oh, so I'm going there to go and see an ACDC cover band. It's going to be really fun. But right. I literally had like no idea that this club was built in the 90s. And like so many celebrities. Yeah. Like, obviously now I'm like, I'm more familiar with the history of it. I was actually going to do a series of posts on it, but. Yeah. That's okay. Everybody's got to learn from somewhere, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, Eric, we have been at this for an hour, and I do not want to keep you long, even though I would love to continue this conversation. But it's like, if you can keep going for, I don't know, like a little while longer, we, def we definitely can. If you need to go, I completely understand. I'm just saying it's been like, what, 58, almost 59 minutes. Yeah, I've got, I've got a little bit of time left for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, as I was saying with the Viper Room, um, when I first started doing my blog, I was doing a series of posts, uh, which were <clears throat> basically a series of facts. And every single like batch of facts was under a spe specific theme. And I was getting my information online. Like, obviously, I wasn't like copying it word for word. I was paraphrasing it. And I was mm. like, getting my sources. So, like, even though people liked what I was posting, it was... Yeah my original research well it was my original research but it wasn't like information that i like discovered by myself from like the real original source and after uh i just finished my first semester um as a journalism student in santa monica college and even just one like this one semester of classes taught me how to like actually do original research and I should just like start reaching out to people and talking to them and so here I am that's great yeah that's an amazing story for sure well look you got to create what you wanted to do and you know even in fashion you can only go to school for so much until I think a lot of people realize not necessarily through fashion but you know if you're learning a trade like something in law or medicine yeah go for university and college anything else i don't know i think you 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 pick up things along the way and you learn by doing you do, i still do i still make mistakes every day maybe nobody notices but in my head sure but the rest of it is just you know we only have one life so you might as well kind of try to do the things that you want to do and don't worry about what anybody else has to say <laughs> Yeah, I actually kind of sort of believe in reincarnation. I think it's the first time that I ever admitted it to anyone, but I do kind of believe in reincarnation. And it would be nice to know that after I depart from this life, that I would end up someplace else. But you are right. Like I, I, I can't imagine what the person that did before my life screwed up so badly to to become this oh like my God, come on. It, it, they must have done horrible stupid things hey, hey, in order on. for the next one to be like well here's this guy's body he's really short he's gonna grow hair everywhere he's gonna be partly deaf wears glasses shaving by 12 years old good luck with him and see how fast you get the girls in high school. You know, you know what I mean? So I, I hope reincarnation doesn't exist on that because when I go, if I have to come back, I better hope and pray that I come back as somebody as good looking as Brad Pitt. Cause I do, cause I so deserve it. Well, don't we all hope uh, for that? I definitely hope that I, uh... When I was a little bit younger, I was hoping that in the next life I would come back a little bit taller because I'm fi I'm five foot one. And okay, I'm five feet. So there you go. So <laughs> we can only we can only go up from here. True. Yeah. True. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I definitely. I mean, if, if if I spike up my hair, I'll be six three. <laughs> but other than that, but yeah. I have a friend who does that. Yeah, one of my friends. Um, he he's in the rock band, and he. He's about my height, and he always, always spikes up his hair. Like, honestly, I have been hanging out with him for the past five, six years, 
I have never seen him without unspiked hair. Well, maybe a couple of times, but it's mostly spiked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when you're when you're that short compared to everybody else, you've got to find that that thing that it's like a small animal where if you've ever seen a squirrel being attacked, they go into like a pouncing mode. Hair is like that too. You've got to kind of go like this instead of pouncing. You can just spike up your hair like that and then, you know, <laughs> become all powerful and knowing. True. True, true. So let's see what else. Actually, like we've ha we've been at this for about an hour and I had like a list of questions that I want to ask you about. Uh, Go for it. We'll, we'll do some rapid fire stuff. Okay. Yeah. Basically about like your career and stuff. So, um, hmm. Okay, so I think that the question that I would want to find out the most is that, um, so you started your career by working with the Smithsonian Folkways Recording. Yeah, I, I loved that label growing up. It was home to Woody Guthrie and, and Lead Belly and all sorts of folk music. And that's what I, I really wanted to work at Smithsonian Folkways. I wanted to get out of Canada and move to Washington and and do publicity for them or do something because they were the they were the greatest label that that I knew at the time. Um, and I still have immense respect for what they do. Um, and so when I got the job offer to work for Koch on the distribution side, we were distributing Smithsonian Folkways. So I actually got to do publicity for them and not leave not leave this country. So that's one of the big reasons why I said yes to working with because I got to end up working with Smithsonian Folkways. Mm -hmm. Nice. Very nice. And where is that um, record label located again? Like where are they? Uh, Washington, D.C. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You said that. Yeah. You said that. Okay. Nice. And what was your position? Uh, so like what was your position with the Smithsonian by the time like when you first started? And what did you end up like doing when you left? I started at Koch as director of media relations in 1999. I ended it with director of media relations seven and a half years ago. Never changed my job title. I was the only person that did publicity. So I was the only person that did the press, radio, and television pitching. Um, and I never really had a staff. I had people here and there that helped out um, with some of the bigger projects in-house, but I didn't want to do anything else. I just wanted to do publicity and I got to do it now for, I guess, coming up on uh, 20, 28, 29 years. Hmm. I see. Okay, nice. Nice. Um, hmm. Okay. So, hmm. And the next question that I want to ask you is, how did you start your public relations company, which is titled That Eric Albert? Um, I The day after I graduated um, from York University in Toronto, um, my partner and I made a list of, of all the things that we could do. Um, and at the top of the list was record label. So we decided to start a record label. Um, oh. We were both fans of music. We were both experienced in business and art and things like that through university on that kind of small, small, small level. And so we started a record label and that turned into a, a booking agency record label. And then that turned into a publicity booking agency record label. And then one day we just woke up and said, you know, we don't have to lose money on any of it. We could just do publicity and work with the artists that we want to work with and not have to worry about whether or not if we were going to sign them to the record label. And that was in 1995 and been doing that ever since. Then I left Koch and Koch got bought out by Entertainment One, which was actually home to the Runaways movie and, and also with Twilight. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I left that. Uh, seven, yeah, just over seven years ago. Uh, and then the day I left, I started my own publicity company, Eric Alper Public Relations, and called up a bunch of people I knew that I was working with already and said, I'm going to start my own company. Do you want to come on? Amazing. And so they all did and been doing it ever since 18 hours a day, seven days a week. Nice. Very nice. Very nice. So, hmm, let's see. Um, 
What social media platform would you say is like the most important for music bloggers these days? Um, it depends on what kind of stuff you're writing about. Um, you know, for for classic rock, and I think if you're writing about rock music specifically, up until I'm going to say the year 2000, it's going to be on Facebook because that's the era and the generation that remembers that the first time around. Um, nobody wants to be on the social media network that came before you. Meaning when I first got on Facebook, all of my friends and peers and age and demographics started to be on Facebook. And then a bunch of us went on Twitter. Few of them went on Instagram for a mid 20 to 35 year olds first social media network was Twitter they might have jumped on to Facebook they're definitely on Instagram not really on TikTok the people whose first social media network was TikTok they might have been on Twitter absolutely not on Facebook and they're probably still on Twitch so you kind of go back one as a kind of courtesy but you live mostly on one so if you're into pop music and you're you're writing about pop music and you have a blog chances are you probably don't even have a blog if you're writing about pop music if you're if you're between the ages of 15 and 25 most people don't really have a blog anymore i only have a blog because i want a home for everything i don't own anything on social media that's the that's the thing that people tend to forget is like Twitter can go away tomorrow and all of those posts will be lost. People, Facebook can sell and go bankrupt tomorrow or do whatever it wants to do. And we don't own any of it. Your website is the only thing that you actually own. Even if you post things on YouTube or SoundCloud and you embed that, you don't own that stuff. Um, They do. So I still have a blog because I wanted a home for everything, for all the stuff I wanted to post about, not just the artist, but just the other fun things I find. Um, so I think that if you are in classic rock, absolutely Facebook, because that's the audience of 65 year olds who remembered the, the 1970s and 60s firsthand. Um, and if you're into hip hop, if you're into pop music, you're probably on TikTok and making your mark that way. Cause there's no reason to send them to another site. Like, you know, like that monetizing it. That's the kind of secret is you've got to have that website in order to monetize it. Unless that you can get your sponsorship that elsewhere to go that will allow you to get paid for your posts on TikTok. But again, you don't own that stuff. That is actually really good advice because I have been running my blog exclusively on Instagram ever since I started it. I do have a Facebook page for it, but I have been really neglecting it lately because, well, hmm. I have been doing recorded interviews mostly ever since I started my journalism classes um, back in February. And since school started, I don't really have time to like create any more posts for my blog specifically because I have to focus on homework. But I have had time to do a couple of recorded interviews here and there. Yeah. Yeah. And just take, just take a minute of an interview and just post it up on Facebook and say for, for the rest of it, go to the website or just post it wherever you are. Oh, yeah. um, I post links. I post you know, links like Facebook. use the rest of the social media networks that all around to bring it to your website. And, you know, uh, it, it's really hard to get people, anybody to listen to an hour it's, it's really hard when you're an artist to get somebody to listen to three minutes worth of music, forget about a whole album of it. But if you give them a little bit of a teaser and something, you know, you'll, you'll find that with any, with anything, with anybody, whether it's you or it's anybody else, you know, give them like five or six minutes of something and then, you know, let them decide if they want to watch the whole thing or not, you know, cause sometimes the best things are said in minute 32 and nobody's going to listen if the best things are in minute 32, you know, that's why when somebody like a Joe Rogan or, um, you know, people who do really long podcasts of two hours, three hours, you never really hear in the media, all the things that they said, you only hear about the one thing that stood out and you use that as your anchor for publicity or for generating, you know, buzz and stuff like that. 
Yeah, I definitely need to try that. And I need to get on video editing while I'm at it because I do not edit my own videos. I always um, have someone do it for me. Well, I'll, but I can definitely get them to make a clip and I will definitely take that into consideration. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Well, Eric, so I, yeah, I have to split because I've got a, I've got a meeting happening now with an artist that I can't tell who it is. We've been um, at this for an hour and 13 minutes. And again, thank you so much for this. Oh, thank you so much, Maria, for, for having me. It was so good to meet you. And the next time I'm, I'm in LA, I'll definitely shoot you off an email. Oh my gosh. Yes, please do so. Thank yeah, you so I will. Much. Bye. Okay. Bye.